007 The World Is Not Enough is always going to be a tricky game to review, which is perhaps why it's taken so long to get around to reviewing it. With what many regard as a genre-defining game for its time, GoldenEye was a blockbuster hit, and aside from Mario 64, it was for many the reason they dropped cold hard cash on picking up N64 hardware. After Rare decided not to exercise their option of making a follow-up game to GoldenEye, Due to their desire to work on a brand new IP, the gaming industry woke up and realised the rights to Bond were available once more. With such a groundbreaking title and a proven winning formula to boot, it's no surprise that The World Is Not Enough is a first person shooter in the same vein as GoldenEye. The other day when looking at How To Lose At Video Games Instagram page, I read something which summarises The World Is Not Enough and Bond games in general even to this day. That was that since GoldenEye, every Bond game has either tried to be just like GoldenEye or has done everything possible to try and not be GoldenEye. I don't feel anyone could really summarise this better. By trying to be like GoldenEye, you would always going to have to bring out an incredible game not to be mocked going up against it. The safer and easier route is to do something completely different to not be compared to GoldenEye and then you can create a game which avoids the ongoing comparisons. Developed by Eurocom and published by EA in the year 2000, 007 The World Is Not Enough follows the plot of the movie from a first person perspective and sees you take control of Pierce Brosnan in his second outing as everyone's favourite spy. Whilst the movie and ultimately the game storyline isn't the most exciting one, the game itself is a surprisingly enjoyable experience which almost manages to bring itself out of the shadows of Goldeneye. Development of the game can be traced as far back as 1998, when Eurocom began developing a new game engine for the next generation hardware. When EA acquired the James Bond license, they accepted pitches, where Eurocom showed off their stable new game engine, and EA were instantly impressed. Work began soon after, and at the same time Eurocom were putting the majority of their time into finishing Mortal Kombat 4. After modifying their new game engine to maximise what the N64 could handle, the game soon began to take shape. Eurocom themselves knew that The World Is Not Enough would be their last N64 game and so wanted to release the game as their final showpiece for the record books. Now production of any Bond movie is always a very secretive affair, however Eurocom were given exclusive access to assets from the movie to help them create a game which replicates many of the movie's scenes and set pieces. In order to make the game flow, the studio took some creative liberties with the title. Um, this really is apparent in some of the missions like London, which is not featured in the movie, but this does help to make the overall game flow as seamlessly as possible. The studio, however, did not make all of their original ideas in the actual game itself. One early idea was to have the player control the speedboat in the chase sequence from the movie. However, this was ultimately changed for a shorter cutscene. The game's producer Bill Beecham felt that to deliver a well-playing vehicle section would take an additional game engine to do it real justice, and so it was scrapped to ensure that the core focus of the game's first player shooter nature remained intact. The game's main menu is clean and crisp and breaks down the game's two main modes which are the single player campaign and its multiplayer offering. Before playing you should definitely head into the game's options menu because there's a huge number of control methods which replicate many of your favourite first person shooters. Everything from Goldeneye to Turok. And so if you are familiar with a specific game's handling, and you can actually select it here in this game, you'll find that you won't need to be learning a whole new control system over again. This really does help because it makes picking up and enjoying the game instantly accessible to almost everyone. Whilst you're in the options menu, you should also change the audio to stereo as for some reason the default setting is mono. And you also have control over the brightness and most importantly the resolution quality and screen ratio. Choose to play the game in 4x3 or widescreen and decide if you want the higher resolution textures with expansion pack support or stick to the standard quality for a slightly better frame rate. Like most expansion pack compatible games on the N64, the trade-off with higher quality textures is the game's frame rate, although thankfully the difference is not as noticeable as it is in some other games. For your reference, this entire video review was recorded in the widescreen high resolution mode, but there's plenty of other channels showcasing the game in other settings if you're interested. 
Now when you jump into the single player campaign, you'll see that there are a good number of levels to play through which are unlocked as you progress through the campaign. The opening bank level is a gentle break into the game with some basic controlled tutorials and enemies to eventually kill. Now the game itself isn't a kill anything that moves style shooter. In most of the levels you'll come across innocent characters, be they simply bystanders, hostages or allies, and so for the, at least the first playthrough of each level you'll need to think before you shoot. Like Goldeneye before it, the difficulty levels in the game add additional objectives which you must accomplish in order to clear the mission. These have a good level of variation and can be as simple as finding an object or reaching a checkpoint, but they can also include defusing bombs and rescuing objectives. These mission parameters are set out before the mission begins with the mission brief screen, and these not only help you with your strategy but also form part of the game's overall story arc. The 14 game missions are a solid mix of game styles, and whilst they all retain the first person perspective, there are some slight variations of this. The skiing level is a standout point in the game which sadly comes across as a poorly executed on rail shooter with some awkward and clunky movement and controls. This level itself feels completely out of place in the game, but naturally as a key point in the movie, it really did need to be in the game. This is an area where I feel the following the storyline of the movie doesn't necessarily help the actual game as it feels forced rather than a natural extension of the core gameplay. That aside though, the game looks great in my opinion. The frame rate is generally solid and the developers themselves stated that they wanted to make this the fastest first person shooter on the console. Now that's hard to argue as I cannot think of another which runs quite as quickly as this, but that's not necessarily a good thing. You see, the speed of the game just pushes you along and it keeps forcing you to do everything as quickly as possible, almost as if there's a constant timer ticking down on the screen. You can blast through rows of enemies in quick succession and you'll naturally find yourself just racing to the next point to do the same thing over again. Games such as Quake 2 and perhaps Doom 64 had a slower pace but this helped you to become immersed in the world and think in more detail about how you're going to be tackling the next area. In the world is not enough you'll find often the levels are over far too quickly for you to remember them in any meaningful way. Now that's a shame because some of the level design in the world is not enough is quite fantastic, but the actual game itself does lead through to multiple playthroughs. The areas and levels in the game are nicely done, which is helped by the lack of issues relating to the dreaded N64 fogging or draw distance issues. You'll rarely see much pop up in the game, and being able to see into the distance really helps especially when you're playing the missions in a stealth like manner and we want to take those long range shots with sniper rifles. Some of the objects in the game are also destructible, and so if you start firing off explosive shells left, right and centre, you can expect to see doors blow off or crates shattering everywhere. One thing that you will have noticed though from watching this footage is a somewhat grainy look to the visuals. Quite simply there is a dithering issue in the game, and even after changing the in-game brightness settings it really didn't alter or change anything. You could be forgiven for perhaps thinking they wanted to have the uh, sort of film grain look in the actual game but I personally feel that this is more of a technical issue that they couldn't overcome rather than, say, an aesthetic choice. The levels in the game are a varied mix of locations taking you from buildings to alleyways to rooftops and submarines. They all look detailed enough to work in their own right and although many of the levels come across as linear, there are moments where maze-like turns will really challenge you. Of course, a Bond game really wouldn't be a Bond game without gadgets and weapons, and thankfully The World Is Not Enough doesn't shy away from the staple of the franchise. The gadgets are all used meaningfully and have not been utilised in the level simply for the sake of it. Using your watch to fire a grappling line you'll need to reach the higher ledge, or night vision goggles to sneak around in stealth mode fits within the overall level design perfectly. There's also the large array of weapons to choose from and although they stick to the standard style of pistols, shotguns, rifles and so on, they each have a great amount of gun detail in them and have some excellent firing animations thanks to the optimised game engine. Detracting from the gameplay though is the enemy AI, which brings the overall game experience down. The AI in Goldeneye was superb for its time and considering this game came out some years later, you'll be scratching your head wondering why the enemies in this game are so dumb at times. You can be blasting away aimlessly at two soldiers stood next to each other without them doing so much as flinching, and then they generally tend to run at you simply blasting their guns trying to stay alive. 
There are moments though where you'll see enemies run away and hide and take pot shots at you from behind cover, and you'll wonder how there's so much variation at different points in the game with the AI. With that said though, if you do want a challenge in the game you really need to be opting for the higher difficulty levels because the poor AI will be counteracted by the increased damage you will be taking. Heading into the multiplayer mode though, you'll see a different side to the AI if you're not playing with three friends. They'll hunt you down with ruthless aggression across the maps and show no signs of mercy. The multiplayer experience is naturally best experienced with three friends, but even in single player you can still have some fun choosing your character, the weapons, the game mode and importantly which level. The multiplayer maps are designed to be fast paced and often contain areas for those who prefer a stealthier approach. The 14 maps are mostly based off the single main campaign missions and they work well within the overall gameplay style as they're just as varied as the main campaign. Even with 4 human players the game still runs smoothly, much more so than Goldeneye, but sadly, now it could just be nostalgia speaking here, but it never had the quite same feel or appeal as Rare's masterpiece. The game's overall audio is one of the highlights in the package though. Although the famous James Bond theme is nowhere to be seen in sight, or heard even, each piece of music in the game does fit in with the level it's taking place in, and so for the faster paced action levels you'll get a more dramatic score, and yet when you have a stealth like mission it'll be a slower and more mysterious style piece. The audio effects are also nicely done, and the sounds of shots firing off are all crisp and clear and have a rich, well sounded level of bass to them. Sadly though, most of the voice acting is actually by voice artists rather than the main actors themselves. Saying that though, you may be forgiven for not realising straight away because the voice actors they've chosen do a good job of portraying the real life characters even if they were given some pretty hammy lines to read from. One highlight though is that none other than John Cleese who plays R in the movies did deliver his own lines in the game which for any Python fan was cool to hear. Coming on a 32 meg cartridge, it meant that there was a huge amount of room for audio, and so from start to finish the game contains over 500 lines of spoken dialogue, which is a phenomenal achievement when you consider this is still a cart based game. Overall though, I really enjoyed The World Is Not Enough, and if anything I believe that if Goldeneye hadn't been released prior to this, then this game would be more highly regarded. It does everything you'd want in a fun first person shooter, such as fluid gameplay, interesting levels, awesome weapons and a storyline which is acceptable. I also like to think about what the game could have done more, and apart from the mixed AI it's really hard to think of any areas in the game which could have been improved upon for the game of the time. Even the multiplayer mode is fun for those wanting a slight change of scenery from Goldeneye, and that is however where I feel the game suffered. With the bar being set so high by Goldeneye, I can't think of any reason why I'd rather play The World Is Not Enough over Goldeneye, despite there being nothing wrong with it. I would say that I prefer to see games complementing one another rather than being in direct competition. I see it as if you like Goldeneye, then chances are you're probably going to like The World Is Not Enough and vice versa. Both games are good, well made and are shining examples of games done right on the console. Of course the flame wars will probably start now in the comment section down below and I'm fully aware that this is generally one of the most divisive titles on the system. There are those who have messaged me over the years eagerly awaiting a discussion around this game as they believe it surpasses Goldeneye and then there are those who despise everything about this game and feel it's nothing more than a poor man's Goldeneye which is why it can often be found in bargain bins even to this day. I'd also love to hear if anyone's parents got them this by mistake instead of Goldeneye back in the day and your reactions to that. I'm sure many parents went into retail stores at Christmas and simply asked the store clerk for the James Bond N64 game and somehow ended up with this. With games often being delayed for years on end, it's a cool piece of trivia for you that the world is not enough actually arrived one month earlier as the developer finished up the game sooner than expected. So can you think of any other examples where a game came out earlier than, than anticipated? As always, sound off in the comment section down below, and until next time.